Let's see if we can. Okay, welcome. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, we obviously couldn't make this wonderful conference possible without our great sponsors. So we want to take a moment to recognize the sponsors that have helped make this possible. Our presenting sponsor is BioMarin. Our gold sponsors are Nutrition Metabolics and Synlogic. Um, our Kid Zone uh, is sponsored by an anonymous donor. A big thank you there so that our kids could have a wonderful opportunity here, as well as us adults have a great opportunity um, to participate without the kids, which is great as well. Um, our silver sponsors are Applied Pharma Research, Cambrick Therapeutics, and the Michaud Family Foundation for PKU. Our bronze sponsors are Abbott Nutrition, Homology Medicines, Inc., and PKU Perspectives. So let's give a, a round of applause. Our conference committee. So if you are here and are a member of our conference committee, will you please stand up? A lot of work has gone in to putting this conference here in Atlanta together. Thank you. And you'll notice that they have a ribbon that says conference committee on it. So if you need any inside intel on, it, on Atlanta or Georgia, they're the folks you want to run down and talk to. And then this is the board of directors of the National PKU Alliance. If you're a member of our board, would you please stand? Thank you. Um, as, a, as a board, we're always looking to connect with the PKU community and listen to the concerns and desires. So if you have something that you'd like to let us know, please find one of us during the conference. And we have the yellow board of directors tag on. We would love to hear from you. And our NPKUA staff, can you please stand? I know they're probably mostly not in here because they're out working, but I, we have, there's Michelle at the back, and Eileen and Christine. Um, Katrina is in the kid zone, uh, which is where she'll spend a lot of the conference. So for those of you who have kids there, please make sure and tell K Katrina a big thank you. We couldn't possibly do the conference without our wonderful staff. So who we are, who is at this conference? So these are updated numbers that I can't see. So 665, thank you, Christine, is our, our new number. I have the old number. So we went up 40 people just in the last couple of days. Um, still 34 states, eight countries? Okay, 34 states and eight countries, which is amazing. Uh, we have folks here I know from Australia, from Europe, from South America. So wonderful that we are able to reach that far and, and have folks here. So thank you all for coming. So housekeeping, this is what's really important. Um, restrooms, um, out of the ballroom, men's is to the right, and women's is directly across from that. Um, we have the professional photographer and the selfie booth. I don't know if you've had a chance to see that kind of in the corner with the exhibitors, but make sure you uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And let me just put in a little plug here. We are doing a reboot of our website and we want new photos. So if you want to be on our website, now is the time to go get your photo taken and then you will find yourself in an NPKUA communication, in an email, on the website. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of that. Does this have breakfast? Okay. Um, so the outside, in addition to the sponsor booths and the exhibitor booths, we have an advocacy booth. So this is to provide information about our federal legislation, about medical food coverage. 
um, as well as just to talk about different advocacy efforts that we're doing. And so that will be staffed uh, out here in the exhibitor area and the registry booth as well. So you'll hear a presentation today about the registry uh, and you can sign up for the registry out there. You can complete surveys. You can have any questions answered. So that's a great opportunity uh, to do that while you're here at the conference. A few more housekeeping notes. Uh, breakfast tom tomorrow is a plated breakfast. So we need everyone to be prompt at 8 o'clock so that you can receive your breakfast service. Uh, for those in the kids zone, we ask that you please pick up the children promptly and drop them off promptly so that the staff in the kids zone can also eat lunch <laughs> uh, and that everyone gets an opportunity uh, to do that. And then Wi-Fi is available in the hotel, uh, but it is not available here in the conference room. Uh, we want to make sure you're paying attention. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you off your devices and uh, you can listen to all the great PKU information we have. Uh, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Christine. Welcome and thanks for being here. Good morning. We are still having some technical difficulties, so hopefully things will be solved uh, soon um, before our other speakers get up. Um, welcome to Atlanta. We're so excited to have you all here with us. So for many of you, you may know that the National PKU Alliance is celebrating our 10th birthday this year. A lot has happened in 10 years. In 2008, Barack Obama was elected as our first African-American president. Michael Phelps won a record eight medals, uh, gold medals, at the Olympics in Beijing. At Home Fitness with We Fit was all the rage. And if you wanted to be hip, and my now 15-year-old was hip, you wore Kanye West shutter shades, and you had winter Crocs. A lot has changed in 10 years. Oops, I went the wrong way. A lot has changed in my family in the last 10 years as well. So this does mark for the National PKU Alliance 10 years of progress in supporting adults and families with PKU accelerating research, and changing lives. A decade ago, there was no centralized source on the internet for scientifically-based information on PKU. In 2009, we launched our first website, and we thought we were very successful because we had 59,000 page views in that first year. Last year, that number increased 14-fold to more than 817,000 page views. Our new parent guide is now given to new parents at metabolic clinics across the country so they don't have to experience PKU alone. And we also developed and released several publications, including my PKU binder that is now being translated into Russian, a returning to diet booklet written by adults, and PKU in the Brain, which was used, is used to educate all of us on new scientific knowledge. In 2008, there was no national voice for PKU in the United States. Now we are heard in the halls of Congress, at the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institute of Health. Uh, through five advocacy pushes, we have walked the halls of Congress and had close to 400 visits with our elected representatives and senators, pushing to fight for federal coverage of medical foods. A national PKU Awareness Day was established, which happens on December 3rd of each year. In 2012, NPKUA staff and volunteers and members of our scientific advisory board all participated in the working groups 
of the NIH Scientific Review Conference for PKU. That meeting by the NIH in 2012 served as the foundation for the first ever medical and dietary guidelines put out by the American College of Genetics and Genomics, as well as Genetic Metabolic Dietitians International. So we all know what we can expect when we visit our clinic for PKU. We've also testified before the FDA at a patient-focused drug development meeting um, on the neurological manifestations of inborn errors of metabolism like PKU. We met with both FDA and the NIH on why we need new treatments in our community. And this past fall, I had the honor and privilege to bring six adults with me to the FDA to share their experiences on how the newly approved drug Pal and Zeek had improved and changed their lives because they were able to reduce their fee levels. So let's talk actually about medical foods. And when we say medical foods, we mean both your medical formula as well as your foods that are modified to be low in protein. Coverage of medical foods continues to be the top concern for our adults and families. And while we will push for new treatments, we will also continue to push that we have coverage for the treatments that we currently have. Most recently, we partnered with the GI community and we formed the Patient and Providers for Medical Nutrition Equity Coalition to pass the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. So I wanna take this uh, time to show you a video. PKU is a rare brain-threatening disorder where people can't process one of the amino acids that makes up protein. You have a genetic mutation where your body cannot break down one amino acid into another. If you're not put on diet as a newborn, you're gonna have severe brain damage and suffer severe intellectual disability. PKU is sort of the poster child for newborn screening. Newborn screening was developed because of PKU. Newborn screening started in the early 1960s when Robert Guthrie figured out that there was a simple way that we could test newborn babies for this condition. Patients with PKU who would otherwise become mentally retarded would have more normal neurological function if they were put on low protein diets. Babies who have PKU need to have therapy for life through careful management, clinic visits, some blood monitoring, uh, and availability to medical foods. These patients can grow and develop normally. Or about 70 to 80 percent of their diet is dependent on a special formula which we use the term medical food. If you take away all of the foods that a person with PKU can't have, you're left with practically nothing. Specialty low protein foods, these are specially manufactured to have less than one gram of protein per serving, and that allows that person to have a good variety of foods and also to have enough food to not be hungry. Medical foods to treat PKU are not prescription drugs. And even though medical foods have been used to treat PKU for more than 50 years, most private as well as public insurance programs will not cover them. So there's an additional condition which is related to PKU when women have PKU and become pregnant. I wasn't planning on having kids. I was just turned 20 when I got pregnant with my first child and I was off diet and I hadn't taken my formula in a couple of years. Medicaid didn't want to pay for the formula. And of course, they don't pay for the foods, the low protein foods. I was struggling with trying to get the Medicaid to cover it and I was pregnant and I needed it then. My youngest son, Charles, he has microcephaly. He has a lot of midline problems, like he was born with one tooth instead of two front teeth. His uh, nose, he's had 13 surgeries on his nose. When he was trying to drink his bottle, he couldn't breathe through his nose because his passageways were closed because of maternal PKU syndrome. It just kind of bothers me that it's so hard to get the formula, even when you're pregnant. These mothers need it or their, their children are gonna have a lot more issues. 
The Medical Nutrition Equity Act is a bill that's before Congress right now that would require all private insurance as well as public insurance programs to cover the cost of medical foods with no age limits, uh, no limits on gender for inherited metabolic disorders like PKU as well as uh, some digestive disorders. Medical Nutrition Equity Act is a must. It will assure access to the medical foods to the families who need it. If people were able to get the coverage that they needed for their formulas and everything, I would be ecstatic. I know that I would definitely be able to be myself again because you're not yourself when you're not on, on your diet or on your formula. Imagine your child having this disease and how it would feel to you to have all of these additional financial burdens placed on you when you're struggling to cope with raising this child appropriately so that he or she doesn't feel like they have a handicap and can be normal and have a productive life, even though they have to do all of these special things with their diet. Patients with PKU who are poorly treated and become marginally competent adults uh, confer a much greater cost on the country in terms of productivity than the therapy would ever be. I, I just think that 55 years after we invented newborn screening, to not have formula for all patients is really a, a terrible thing in the country that we, uh, that we think America is. For those of you new, who know me well, I always have certain asks that I do um, with you at each conference. And so my first ask is you need to go visit our advocacy booth and speak with Kristen. We need you to contact your legislators so we don't have babies born with maternal PKU syndrome, so we don't have adults and families that struggle to get coverage for a treatment that we've had for more than 50 years. So that's my first ask of you. Kristen will be out there. She can help you. She can let you know who your legislators are. And we will have talking points available. This video will also be available for us, for you, on our website. And we will be asking that you share it with your legislators to help get this message across. And until we have that federal law for coverage, we will continue to provide support for families and adults fighting insurance denials with our contractor, Compassion Works, and Renette Franco. Renette is with us at this meeting. Renette, are you in the room? There she is, back there. So Renette has her own room here to meet with you and help if you are getting denials. She has already helped 211 adults and families through our insurance coaching program, and there is no cost to you. In addition, our emergency foods program for adult women who are pregnant um, has helped 160 women get access to emergency low-protein food through a collaboration with Nutricia and Cambrook, as well as a subscription to How Much Fee for a better chance for a healthy baby. We also have a maternal PKU mentoring program where our trained mentors have provided social support to other women seeking to become pregnant or are pregnant so they don't have to walk this journey alone. So this right here is our signature event when it comes to education. Every two years, we bring together all of you to network, make new friends, and learn the latest in PKU research and best practices. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are here for the first time? Wow, welcome. We hope to have you back.
Is there anybody, there has to be a few people in the audience who have actually made it to all five conferences. So we started in Dallas in 2010, then we went to Philly, then we went to Salt Lake, we went to Indy. Wow, a lot more than I thought. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're here with us again. A decade ago, when the NPKUA started, there was no centralized or scientific review process in place to guide families' investments in PKU research. Since then, you have helped us invest close to $3 million to better understand PKU and drive PKU research forward. Early on, we established an international panel of experts to review and recommend proposals for funding to accelerate research and a timeline for a cure. They put out a formal request of proposals each fall. They evaluate each proposal based on established criteria, and then they recommend to our full board of directors what grants and fellowships we should award. So let's take a brief look at where your research dollars have made a key difference. Our investment in cellular therapy has led to the first US patient to receive a liver cell transplant as a possible cure for PKU at the University of Pittsburgh. Our support of bone health research has led to additional funding from the FDA for further clinical study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Our support in gene therapy at the Oregon Health and Science University has led to an additional $1.2 million grant from the NIH. And our home fee monitor challenge, which you'll hear about later today, has accelerated techno technology development. Our funding at the, University of, or at the University of Missouri has led to new understanding of white and gray matter in the PKU brain, which has led to new scientific knowledge. And our support of postdoc fellowships has helped grow the next generation of talent. Our most successful fundraising efforts have come through our nationally branded events called Lifting the Limits for PKU. Local parents, grandparents, and adults drive these events at the local level, and we provide the needed infrastructure support and funding to make them happen. All of these events support the NPKUA fund to drive research, advance treatments, and pursue a cure. Lifting the Limits has invested more than $2 million in the NPKUA fund. Later this morning, you will hear from Betsy Bogard, a consultant that we hired last year to help us further develop our research strategy as our capacity to invest in PKU research has grown. I'm not gonna tell you everything that she discovered and what we agreed to pursue, but I do wanna highlight a few things. The most important thing that any one of us can do, so this is my second ask, is to join the PKU patient registry. You will hear more about the registry in today's afternoon session, but just let me say that patient registries give science and companies the information and de-identified data they need to find a cure. And my involvement and your involvement is key. As I've already mentioned, Tom Franklin will give you an update on how we've been able to advance science and technology of a home fee monitor. And I'm also pleased that Lex Kausert has joined us as a part-time new director of development or research development to help us implement and grow our research strategy. One of the most important and critical things that we can do as a patient organization is build infrastructure support to all therapeutic approaches to PKU. Now, this first bullet is kind of a mouthful, 
We need to obtain regulatory agreement on clinically meaningful and patient-centered endpoints in adults. So in its very simplest form, clinical endpoints are the primary outcome that is measured by a clinical trial. So a clinical endpoint is an outcome that represents direct clinical benefit. So for example, think of cancer research. What do you think is the most important clinical endpoint in cancer research? Pretty easy, survival. So let's think about PKU, let's take it a step further. What is the most meaningful clinical endpoint in PKU? A drop in fee levels, right? And yes, that continues to be the most primary uh, and most important clinical endpoint, but we have a challenge. Fee levels affect people very differently. Anybody else notice that? Right? That's just a balloon popping. We're good. <laughs> right? Fee levels affect people very, very differently. So, for example, you know, I know some people in our community um, that have to, to what I consider pretty high fee levels, maybe 15 milligrams per deciliter. And I have to say, they're doing pretty well. They're teachers, they work in management, um, they seem to lead very successful lives. And then I know others that might have that same fee level or even a fee level lower, and you just can tell, right, that something just isn't right. You kind of feel like you're talking to a brick wall or you notice that their reaction time is slower. You can tell that they're really struggling. Same clinical endpoint, right? We all want lower fee levels. But there's something more to the PKU story. So high fee levels affect people in very different ways. In addition, we now know that your symptoms are not just about your current fee level. Your symptoms are also about your fee level throughout your whole life, as well as your fluctuation in fee levels. The current uh, endpoints that have been used in PKU beyond fee levels, so we're talking about neurocognitive tests or executive function, those right now are basically based on preferences of our neuropsychologists and medical professionals. They're not based on well-designed studies because we don't have them. And there's currently no instruments that accurately measure symptoms for all adults. In addition, any instrument for future trials doesn't have to just show an improvement in those executive function skills, but we have to be able to show how that translates into a better quality of life. So the NPKUA hopes to lead the way in developing a framework to determine what meaningful, patient-centered, and scientifically-based endpoints can be considered and accepted in future clinical trials. And this journey is actually going to begin here in Atlanta on Monday when we're bringing together people from the FDA, from the NIH, and some of our top neuropsychologists and clinicians and researchers to begin this conversation. So imagine what can happen two years down the road when there's companies out there that are looking at developing new treatments, and we can say, as a patient community, this is what we want. This is what we need in terms of new treatments, and they all know what to measure. That's going to lift everybody up in terms of new treatments that are there. Now, before I uh, introduce our next speaker, I want to show you one more video. And of course, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing.
Mala was born on a Tuesday and we went into her follow-up appointment on Saturday and the doctor sat us down and um, Dr. Schreier told me that Olive had PKU and that it was serious. I didn't really know what that meant so she sat me down and explained it to me. But we couldn't get into the PKU clinic until Monday so that weekend was really rough because we didn't have a formula yet and we um, researched and figured out that the formula was crucial for brain development and so that was a really rough and stressful weekend nursing her and not knowing if I was causing damage. Before I food, um, I ask my mom and dad if I can have it and then they weigh it for me. I feel hungry a lot. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard when they're hungry, they've had their formula, they're still hungry, and they're at their limit. When I found out I was pregnant, it was both exciting and terrifying at the same time because you're now responsible, it's not just your PKU, you're responsible for a baby that is growing and its health. You have to control your blood fee levels and if those blood fee levels are not controlled, it will result in maternal PKU syndrome with the baby. And what that is, is the effects on the baby are um, interuterine growth restriction, microcephaly, congenital heart anomalies, and developmental delay. When you're a teenager, you really don't like feeling different, and PKU makes you feel very, very different. A PKU is an inherited disorder that involves a problem with protein metabolism. Individuals have trouble metabolizing a very specific part of protein, a specific amino acid, phenylalanin. The elevated blood phenylalanin actually um, damages the brain. And so it's important from a treatment standpoint to try to reduce the phenylalanine levels in the body as much as possible to try to prevent the brain problems. And we treat them initially with a dietary therapy that reduces their intake of phenylalanine. Foods that I can't eat include pizza, hamburgers, fish and steak, milk, chocolate milk, ice cream. You're hungry. When you have um, PKU, you're, you're, you're hungry pretty much all the time. Dietary therapy alone is very difficult for, for many people, the majority of people, to keep their blood fees down where they, where they need to be. I was diagnosed at birth. They put me on a, a formula right away at birth. Then I went pretty much completely off my diet as my uh, late teens, early 20s. And that was, a big mistake and that's partially how I have some of my problems is how I lost track of my diet. I've got uh, a lot of neurological problems. I've had multiple seizures. Um, I, my muscles shake. Um, Um, I don't know, my, basically my neurological system is shot from being off diet. A lot of our teens and adults are no longer on dietary therapy because it is so difficult to do every single day for the rest of your life. Well, it's really hard, you know, I can't have a lot of stuff that my friends can have, like chocolate, pizza, and all that stuff. Sometimes it really frustrates me. And I bet that's the same for all the other kids that want a cure too. The existing therapy is not good enough. Quite a few people whose blood phenylalanine start to elevate over time is that we do start to see more significant problems with attention issues, uh, mood, uh, being able to carry out complex instructions and tasks and almost everybody with PKU, even if they're in quite good control, we find some abnormalities on the pictures that we get of the brain. Primarily, it, the most common thing that we see is that the white matter, which is sort of the wires that connect all the different parts of your brain, seems to be um, abnormal in its um, consistency, if you will. If there was a cure for PKU, I would want to have fudge. We're concerned for our daughter, for her brain health. The research that MPKUA is funding uh, is helping us learn more about this disorder and 
What we're learning is uh, that the diet's not enough uh, and that um, the brains of folks that have been treated have differences from uh, folks that don't have PKU. It's never really a worry that goes away, whether you're pregnant or you're just watching your child grow. I would like my friends not to feel hungry anymore. Your investment here tonight will help us fund the most promising peer-reviewed research that will lead to new therapy discoveries and an eventual cure for PKU. PKU is largely a disease about limits. Its effects can put severe limits on a person's ability to develop, function, and thrive. Help us face fewer limits and brighter possibilities for the future. Please, Please help, help us. Lift the limits for PKU. So, I still need your help in finding a cure. In a minute, you are, he you are going to hear from Geyer Furling LGO. His grandfather, Ashburn Furling, discovered the condition that we all know as PKU. And you'll have a chance to hear his amazing story. And I think what I appreciate so much about Dr. Furling is that he never gave up. He never gave up to understand the condition we call PKU. He never stopped, and we will not stop. We will continue to raise funds for research to improve the lives of our loved ones here so that we have new treatments and that we have a cure. Now, I know a lot of you paid a lot of money to come here, registration, airfare, hotel, but I am asking you to consider one more investment while you're here. Private support is what makes our work possible. And so I want you to consider to make a gift of any size to the National PKU Alliance. I need $5, I need $50, I need $500, and I need $5,000. This additional investment will help us continue what we do and get to what everybody wants in this room, a cure. Our goal is to raise $10,000 in honor of 10 years of progress. So I want you to all get out your phones. I didn't bring my phone with me, but I see lots and lots of phones on the tables. And it's really easy. All you need to do is text PKU to number 41444. This is also on the back of your program. But again, all you need to do is text PKU to 41444 and complete the information. And we will have running results with donor names scrolling on these screens and a thermometer as we reach our goal. Oh, look, see, we already have somebody. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go back a slide, maybe. Too much. We also already have our next conference venue and our dates secured. I know many of you plan your family vacations now around our conferences. So even though we're just beginning our conference here in 2018, I hope to also see you in 2020 in Vancouver, Washington, which is like literally five miles away from Portland, Oregon. And before I leave you, just remember, I need you to do three important things in the next three days. Visit our advocacy booth and contact your senators and your representatives about medical foods. Join or update your information in the patient registry. You even get Amazon gift cards for doing so. And text PKU to 41444 to help us 
with the next 10 years of progress for a cure. Thank you. And now I am extremely fortunate to be able to introduce you to Geyer Furling Elgio. Geyer lived